What's good guys, it's illsun 4 k and welcome to another first on my channel here at IllTV, illsun 4 ks <laughs> Top 5. Now, much like the other show you've seen, the cultural impact and importance of, link down below if you haven't seen that yet, we will be covering various things across pop culture media from various decades, various time frames, various genres, horror, cartoons, animation, all that good stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to start this off with one of my first and fondest memories like I did on the cultural impact and importance of, the arcade beat -em. Yes, in the late 80s to early 90s, before Street Fighter 2 would come out, along with Mortal Kombat and take over developers making fighting games, it was all about the beat em up. A quarter munching marathon that you and a bunch of your friends, sometimes up to four or more, even actually the X Men cabinet, I believe, allowed six, allowed you and your friends to go on screen and beat up numerous amounts of endless baddies, as well as boss fights and everything else in between. And of course, developers were constantly trying to outdo one another with new innovative ways to get those quarters out of your mother's and father's pockets and into the machine. So so join me as we take a look at one of the most fun genres that's still being made to this day with the graphical advents that are out there now, and make sure you grab your basics, which of course are the following. A muscle t-shirt, don't forget your 80s style denim vest, we cannot absolutely forget the accessorized jewelry, and of course, don't forget the various sources of weapons not to be limited to, such as your basic, you have a knife, metal pipe, sledgehammer for you crazy motherfuckers that are more of the tank status, 2x4. I'm not really sure what this is, I think this is quarter inch round molding from my apartment, but you could definitely hurt someone with it, I think. A kendo stick slash bat slash swinging melee item. So join us- oh, wait, almost forgot. The beat em up boots are when you want to kick a motherfucker across the screen. Yes, folks. So make sure you join me right now as we check out my favorite top five beat em ups of the arcade genre, some of which got home ports, some of which did not. And make sure you stick around and like and subscribe to the channel, and let's kick it off with number five right now. <laughs> So, Golden Axe and Arcade Beat-em-Ups go hand-in-hand -hand like any other game in this series that I'm about to list off of the top five, but this one was something that I found out only about recently because I didn't play it that much in the arcades, but after I bought my first full-size arcade cabinet, I had heard about it and I decided to give it a go, and I had to just be like, holy crap. This is everything I could want in a Golden Axe sequel ever before because I had only played Golden Axe 2 on the Sega Genesis and that was about my time with the series. Now, this is a pretty interesting one because it actually features none of the original characters from the first game. And in addition to that, being a child of the 80s, I was a huge fan of fantasy at the time. I mean, gigantic fan, such as The Dark Crystal and The NeverEnding Story. So this series really did a great job of capturing the more gritty side of that and putting it into your hands and letting you swing around as barbarians and everything like that. And to be quite honest with you, this is how you do a third game in the series after the second game was a little okay, but this was fantastic. And we're going to talk more about why it's so great right now. I gotta say, the gameplay for this is seriously an upgrade from the second game. Sega really went above and beyond for the arcade tech at the time to make sure this took advantage of tighter controls, smoother frame rates, better animation, and absolutely insane magic attacks that showed up close faces of the individuals that you were attacking getting burned, turned to stone, electrocuted, and overall smited to absolute hell. Fantastically well done. There's actually a really cool pseudo 3D part where you would go around and chase the elves that you would normally chase in between the levels of the last two, where you would kick them and beat them trying to get the magic and the food, but again, it's like a pseudo 3D where you're going down a hallway and you chase and beat them. And Sega was even cool enough to not just leave it to that, but actually gives us a boss battle during one of these pseudo 3D things that was absolutely fantastic. So the only real minor issues I can say about this game is it does use a lot of old sprites from the previous games, mostly the larger enemies, some of the animals you ride are clearly just rips from the old game with no updates at all. I mean, it literally looks like the old 80s sprite put into a 1992 game, but it's something you have to really be looking for. And to be quite honest with you, they really make up for that 10 times over, not just in gameplay, but in the fact we get three brand new characters that we've never seen before. Actually, I think it's four brand new characters, one of which who isn't even a human. It's a woman that's a half human, half centaur affair, like a Motaro type of thing. And the new animals we get are fantastic. There's actually a gigantic scorpion, and I mean this thing is gigantic, that you could ride and has an electrical death sting, and in addition to that, there's not one but two of these cool-ass praying mantises. One that breeds fire, and another one that does these crazy-ass kung fu throws that's black and orange. I'm telling you, Bruce Lee would be proud. So, Golden Axe Revenge of Death Adder was released more towards the end of the hype of the beat-em-up genre, when it had already reached its peak and was on its way down, and a little bit before digitized graphics of Mortal Kombat would come along the next year, although Pit Fighter was already out, but the digitized graphics of Mortal Kombat, of course, what made things more popular, 
and that didn't really affect the popularity of this game because like I said it just wasn't positioned in a great place because even though Mortal Kombat wasn't out yet Street Fighter 2 was and that was starting to really suck away people from the beat-em-up genre and pull them into the new era of fighting games and this game just got a little bit overlooked it wasn't one I saw a lot in the arcades but that doesn't really change the fact that this game was an absolute step up in every way shape and form and a final hurrah for Golden Axe that Sega made sure they cheaped out on nothing with as I said better graphics better animation better controls better everything right down to the fact we get four brand new fresh faced characters animations for the magic were of course as I stated fantastic and even though the fantasy genre was also on its way out no one could deny that this was a fantastic way to end this series and Sega did it right <laughs> Final fight. You knew this was going to be on here. Because if it wasn't, it's not even a top 5 list for beat em ups at all. Final Fight was fantastic and one of the first beat em up games I really played that had me go, wow, look at that game. Final Fight stepped up the graphics of what a beat em up could be by leaps and bounds, and I mean way more than anybody had anticipated. Capcom was so excited with its excitement from the original Street Fighter, not Street Fighter 2, Street Fighter 1, that it actually wanted to call this game Street Fighter 89 and make it more of a beat-em-up genre versus a fighting genre. Until arcade vendors at a vending show looked at them and said, dude, this isn't Street Fighter at all, you should really do something else with this, I don't know. So instead they made Final Fight, and thank god they did, because we wouldn't have gotten the Street Fighter 2 that changed everything for fighting games everywhere if it wasn't for this game, which is really crazy to think about if you really think about it. So, much like the Double Dragon game before, this game does feature a damsel in distress needing to be rescued from an environment, but this time around it's a little different. Instead of being a wife or a girlfriend that's been kidnapped or killed, it's actually the mayor's daughter of Metro City. Yes, the mayor's daughter. Now, this makes sense until you find out who the mayor is, a man named Mike Hager. Mike Hager is a gigantic man. I mean, he was an 89 creation, which means he makes the pro wrestlers of that time look small. And I don't know why anybody would take a dollar from him, let alone his daughter, okay? The guy is absolutely terrifying to look at and amazing to play with. And in addition to that, there are two other characters for you to play as, because of course, as a beat-em-up, you need to have a cabinet where two players can play, and that can't work if there's only one guy, which is ironic because the two characters' other names are Guy and Cody. One is more of a street brawler, and the other one is more of a street fighter, if that makes sense, with the martial arts ability. It's a little interesting, but again, a lot of fun. And what a fantastic job Capcom did with the graphics for Metro City. Metro City feels like a real breathing city, but this game doesn't just look good more than the games that came before it. It actually looks better than a lot of beat-em-ups that came out after it, including Golden Axe Revenge of Death Adder, which isn't an ugly game by any means, but this game's attention to detail and the large colorful sprites was second to none for its time. Really, I remember playing this and being like Double Dragon Poop, because this was the next level, literally. Capcom made sure that everything about this game was fantastically well done, and there isn't really a cheaped out element to it at all. The enemies wear these bright yellow jackets that look gorgeous, the bosses with their dreadlocks that flop about just look great. Everything about it, including the atmosphere and environments, right down to the train car level, where you fight inside of a train car that has the scrolling parallax going in the background, and it has the graffiti all over the car, and the lighting from it looks like real fluorescent lighting that would happen. They did a lot for something that was very limited in the time of 1989 to 1990, and really had no competition whatsoever and really looked, like I said, a lot better than most of the games that came out after it for that fact. And Capcom just really showed them that it wasn't just fighting games they could do right, they could also do a beat-em-up like nobody's business. Gameplay is really something else in this game because it was one of the first games to take a beat-em-up and really make each individual character felt like they played on their own and they weren't a variation of the other. For example, you have Mike Hager who is of course this gigantic muscle-bound guy who has all sorts of wrestling moves such as pile drivers and power bombs and all that other stuff. And you have Cody and Guy who were more street fighter and street brawler types and had their own abilities to do things like spin kicks and heavy dash punches and whatnot it was really really a fantastic game and of course they had the two button power move where it would take away some of your energy but was great for clearing enemies out when they were both surrounded around you and of course making you spend more money on the quarters ironically enough though cody and guy would actually go on to be in street fighter games later on as well as another guy from this named sodom and roland who were actually enemies in the game so it's interesting to see the way capcom crossed over everything even though this game was originally like i said supposed to be the original street fighter sequel so all these awesome elements combined by Capcom gave us one of the best beat-em-ups to come out across the board. The beat-em-up genre was just starting to really pick up steam and get hot in the arcades when Capcom released this, 
And this game's entire step up of quality in the genre made sure that everything that could be possibly done with the genre was taken to the next level and definitely set the bar super high for a lot of individuals to come out and try to play against it. Now, there were sequels to this game, but none of them ever came out for the arcade. They were all home console releases, so I can only wonder what would have happened if that did happen. But nonetheless, this was a fantastic game that really did its best to make sure the characters and environment and gameplay were all seamlessly intertwined and provided a very enchanting and entrancing experience. And again, Capcom knew what they were doing. Okay, so as a child of the 80s, and being an arcade level, you knew a Turtles game was going to be on here. But I had to figure out the great debate for myself that I hadn't done yet. Which one was better? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles the arcade game, or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time? And while I will say the very first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade game, I did own the home port on Nintendo, which of course was nowhere near as good as the real thing, but I had a lot of fun with it with my friends at the time, and even played the game a lot quite with my mom. But after I did, like I said, get my arcade cabinet, and I sat down and realized which one was the better one, it was a no-brainer. This game was fantastically well done, and so was the first one, but this stepped everything up just like all the other sequels on this list. And this is back when Konami was churning out a lot of seriously high-quality, IP-based arcade cabinets, such as this, The Simpsons, and even X-Men, which was run all on the same game engine, but played fantastically. Now, what I have to say is, the reason why I like this is, it took a concept that was mildly played out at the time, which is of course time travel, and applied it to the Turtles in a way that no TV episode could have worked, making it feel more like its own story and distinctive thing, versus just being, again, an elongated episode like the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game felt. The fact that you fight Shredder basically right away in the game is pretty misleading after that, as he banishes you to other time periods and then goes and rains havoc on New York while you're stuck in the prehistoric era, or you're stuck on a pirate ship, or somewhere else. So again, Konami really went above and beyond to make this game refreshing, not just in the graphics and gameplay department, but in the storytelling department, and that was pretty damn cool for the time. So, the gameplay in this is exactly what you've come to expect from a Konami licensed IP arcade game at the time. But because this game came out much like the early 90s versus the late 80s, all the advents that have been applied to the engine were much more noticeable, and the advents over the previous game were fantastic. Some of the advantages over the previous game were example for the ability to slam enemies into other enemies when you slam them back and forth, thus being able to clear out the attack if you're being double teamed from both sides a lot easier. Also, unlike the very first game, this game has special attacks where you can make the turtles do crazy things like spin around with their swords or do a drill torpedo attack across the screen, which took some energy but was great to have because again, the ability to break up the monotony of just jumping, punching, and kicking was greatly appreciated. Another thing that was really fantastic, of course, in the gameplay department was the fact that the bosses in this game were, of course, IP-addressed enemies, such as Triceratons when you would be inside of the prehistoric level. They made sure not to just give you generic no-name bosses, all because you were in the different time periods, but actually let you fight enemies that you knew and saw on the TV show and that made sense to their current time. Although sometimes it would be funny to see Rocksteady and Bebop dressed up for their time period boss battle as whatever it was at the time. Furthermore, a really cool thing about this was you didn't just fight in the past, you actually fought in the future on the moon and in a retro futuristic city. It was really, really well done for the gameplay department by Konami on this, by making it just as fresh and exciting as the storyline made it meant to be. When it comes to graphics, we all know Konami never slacked in that department. This game looks just as good as the first game, but ten times better if that makes any sense. What really is fantastic is, the Turtles animations and drawings look way better than the first one, and dare I say they look a little bit more fierce. The attention to detail in their drawings and the shadowing of their muscles and all that stuff that they didn't have in the first game really sticks out. But I gotta tell you what the real treat is in this game that absolutely blows me away every time I play it is the attention to detail on the boss sprites. The bosses look fantastic. Even the first boss of Baxter Stockman with his pizza dough hand is just so bright and beautiful. And then you have other things like I said like Triceratons. And then you have in the background things going on like gigantic Krang shooting lasers at you. The levels and ambience to that are just so well done and drawn as well that it makes the whole game the real complete package when it comes to the graphics. Even the simple foot soldiers look much better than the first game. And again, that's really saying a lot because the first game was fantastically drawn and well done for its time. Konami really cut no corners on this game and made sure that it rode that last little bit of the Turtle Mania wave hype and made sure that everyone could dump as much money into it until the Turtles in Time home port came for the Super Nintendo not too long after.
<laughs> now, we all know this usual suspect was going to show up on the list and is yet another masterpiece from Konami. But what might surprise people about the placement of this game on the list is the fact that I have it so high up when it was one of the earlier releases that lacked the true refinement of a Konami IP that would come on later after. But the fact remains, this had to be on here. Because much like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Simpsons Mania was totally a thing, and you could probably rival the amount of times that Bart Simpson's face showed up on a piece of merchandise, be it a shirt, a poster, a towel, anything, as much as the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles did. And as a matter of fact, the Simpsons gave us one of the best Burger King toy tie-ins ever, with those crazy plush dolls that you had to buy, and you couldn't just get as part of the meal. I remember I had all five, but what I really remember is how much I loved this game anywhere I saw it, and how quickly I had to beg my mom and dad for a quarter to put it in, so that way I could just get my fix because this game was something else and a lot of fun. Now, the story of this game fits something that sounds like it came from a Simpsons episode in and of itself. Mr. Smithers is of course now robbing a store on behalf of Mr. Burns for a diamond, which makes no sense because Mr. Burns has enough money to buy a goddamn diamond mine versus having to have Smithers steal one giant diamond. I mean, makes no sense. Anyway, as Smithers runs out the door, he bumps into the Simpsons, and unfortunately the diamond flies in the air and lands in the mouth of Maggie Simpson after knocking out her pacifier great way to take something we're all familiar with there and make it a part of the story that's just, again, nonsensical. How it works is, of course, Smithers takes the baby and decides to go off on his own, and now it's up to the Simpsons to go out and save Maggie Simpson. And that's where I think the real true charm of this game lies. Let's take a look at the main people that you play as here. They aren't superheroes, they aren't street fighters, they aren't brawlers, they aren't Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. They're the Simpsons, your atypical average American family. And I think that's something that really makes this game so much fun because again, you're playing as something that doesn't make sense as a hero. They could have done this as a side scroller like they did on The Simpsons for all the goddamn Nintendo games, but no. They went above and beyond and made sure that this game was just as much fun as possible while being as ridiculous as The Simpsons episode itself. So I gotta say the gameplay in this game is really fantastic for a bunch of people who can't shoot lasers out of their eyes or summon magic spells or do anything crazy with super power up attacks. No, they give these characters the most fitting attacks possible for each individual one. You have Homer who just swings his fist like the tank that he is, Marge swings a vacuum cleaner, Bart Simpson swings a skateboard, and Lisa swings a jump rope. It's awesome. Of course, they have their special attacks that drain a little bit of energy, just like all the other Konami games, but another neat little treat is you could actually take someone like, say, Bart and Homer and stack them on top of one another and have Homer throw Bart at one of the enemies. Again, it was just so well done and how much fun you could really have, because in the background of all of this, of course, there's cameos from other characters, such as Otto, Moe's Tavern makes an appearance, the bosses are really fun to watch and fight because they're innovative and require a little bit of thinking they're all not just, you know, tanks that run around. Some of them fly, some of them float. I gotta tell you, The Simpsons did a great job in making sure that this game was as much fun to play as it was to look at, because graphically, this game also did some really cool stuff. And that's not to say graphically this game is uh, a final fight or a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Turtles in Time in terms of its look, but that's kind of the beauty behind it. Because the show was kind of cheaply animated for the time using cell shaded graphics that really didn't have a lot of shadows or definition, they didn't need to apply a lot of that to this game. And by cell shaded, I of course I mean the fact that Bart's shorts are just blue and nothing else, and the shirt is orange, and his skin is yellow, and they don't have fingernails. They didn't have any real definition to them that needed to be drawn, and made designing this game looking a lot like the TV show very easy. And another thing that was really fun about the graphics is they were very generous, much like the Turtles game, in picking out as much as they could from the TV show and putting it into the game without making it feel forced, because majority of it was just background stuff. Like I said, Moe's Tavern is in here, Itchy and Scratchy Land is in here, we also have some really cool uh, innovative ideas, such as one where they're on a movie set, and it's actually a graveyard affair, and you fight off these graveyard baddies that after you beat them up, you see the costumes knock off, and they're regular baddies. But the funny thing is, again, all of it looks very familiar, nothing looks uh, out of place or stupid, even a forest level that they had looks fantastic with the running water in the background, and the bears on the ball, and the itchy and scratchy land. I could go on for days about how great this game looked for the time, but just how great it looked for what it was supposed to be, and that was a cartoon show. Again, Konami cut no corners on this game either, despite it being a little bit of an earlier release before they really started sinking their teeth in on what they could do with arcade cabinet hardware. I was a huge fan of it, I think everybody's a huge fan of it, and it's one of those games that just had to take every quarter you could from your pocket, because come on man, it was The Simpsons. <laughs>
Now, this one is going to catch a lot of people off guard because you would have figured one of the lower ones on this list would have been my top one because this is kind of an older game, but it was brought to us by the same people who helped bring the beat em up genre to life, both at home and in the arcade, and that was Sega. Spider Man is a game, much like any other superhero, that was meant to have a beat em up. But given the fact that Spider Man doesn't fly and is ground based and takes place in New York City, it's even more prime for the picking that Sega went and gave this guy his own beat em up. My favorite thing about this game, again, is just the fact that it's Spider-Man. I was a huge Spider-Man fan as a kid. My favorite superhero, next to Venom, who has a big starring role in this as one of the main villains. And again, I just, I just couldn't put it into words. The storyline of this starts out rather interesting as we see Spider-Man stopping Black Cat from doing a robbery, which she was sent on behalf of Kingpin. Kingpin allows himself to be trapped, only to find out that there's a magical amulet that he has given to Venom to bake the ability to have the symbiotes come about and fight you in the city. So every enemy you face in this game, not every, but most of them, are actually alien symbiotes that are spawned off by Venom from this magical amulet. And the whole story is just very fun, very comic book-like, and totally sounds like something that would happen in the Spider-Man universe. Now, gameplay for this was kind of interesting, because of course this is a beat-em-up, which meant you had to have multiple people playing, so you couldn't just pick Spider-Man. You could pick Spider-Man, Hawkeye, Submariner, and Black Cat. And again, it was really fun and interesting because the other two weren't too much involved in the Spider-Man series, quite like Black Cat, but they were just as much fun to play as. Now, the beat-em-up aspect of this game is very satisfying. Much like other games in this, the sound effects were fantastic when you would hit someone. The fact it takes place in New York City was also very fun, but the really cool part about this game is it actually switched up the monotony of a beat-em-up by making it go from a beat-em-up level to a side-scrolling level. That was right, side-scrolling platforming would happen, and the game would pan out from being a close-up beat-em-up, and make it so that way you were platforming and jumping around and fighting villains like that. You got a little bit of a different ability on the tax because you couldn't move up and down in the playing field, instead you just went left and right, as with side-scroller would. Now, my favorite thing about this is the fact that you actually fight the bosses in both versions of this. Yes, so for example, when you were on the ground fighting Green Goblin, in a beat -em up game, fighting a guy who's a flyer like that is a little bit of a pain in the ass because the screen is so up close and you kind of got to time the attacks perfectly, but in a side-scrolling element, fighting the Green Goblin was fantastic because you had the ability to jump so much higher and have so much screen room. They really, really made sure that this game was fun and innovative as much as it was innovative and fun, if that makes sense. I can't tell you how much money I really pumped into this game every time I saw it, as again, this is my favorite arcade beat em up in the mall, and the gameplay alone was worth the price of admission every time. Graphics wise, I have to give this game its flowers. This game is just as beautiful as Final Fight from Capcom that came out around the same time, but it has its own unique art style as, again, it's a comic book based IP, so everything looks like it was ripped straight from a comic. Now, this is fantastic because you have something such as the backgrounds in this game, which are mostly NYC, though you do go to other areas, but mostly in the NYC areas you just have the brick based sword fronts and the glass and the windows, and they could have cheaped out and kept everything very one dimensional and not given any depth. But for example, in the brickwork, if there's such a part where the bricks have a curvature or might be farther back, than one of the other architectures of the bricks, they give it a nice shadowing effect that really lets you know they put a lot of effort into making it feel like you're in the comics and the attention to detail is just as good as a comic book panel. In addition to that, the sprite work in this is fantastic. Spider-Man himself looks great with his red and blues and the black lines breaking up the architecture. No colors really bleed into one another. You have the other main characters such as Black Cat and Hawkeye who look fantastic as well and they're all jet black affair for Black Cat and Hawkeye having that vibrant purple and dark blue color. Submariner looks pretty damn decent for what it's worth because again he's just a guy running around in his green underwear. The architecture of the sprites for the enemies is really where this game shines. And I'm not just talking the little fodder enemies that make those weird noises when they die, which is pretty fucking funny to be quite honest with you. I'm talking about the bosses. Yes, you have your usual suspects of bosses in this game, such as Scorpion, Hobgoblin, Green Goblin, Electro, Lizard, Venom, Kingpin. All of them look great, and again, all of them look great in two different formats. Not just in the up-close beat-em aspect, but when you switch to the side-scrolling level and the camera zooms out, of course there's a little bit of loss of detail because the camera is zoomed out, but they did not cheap out or cause any sort of effect that makes you go, man, this is clearly less effort put into this part of it than anything else. There's a part where you fight a giant Venom on the 2D side-scrolling part, and Venom just looks fantastic versus this tiny little Spider-Man, whoever you're playing as at the time. The side-scrolling levels really, really show how much they were putting attention to detail, even when they didn't have to, because again, the architecture of the buildings and the sidewalks and all that stuff just looks great. So yes, this is my favorite beat-em-up of all time. I know it's not one anybody expected, maybe you might have expected it somewhere lower on the list, but to me, this was the game that when I saw it, my eyes just lit up and I had to play it. 
It wasn't exactly the most common cabinet at the time, but believe it or not, this was the highest selling arcade cabinet of its release in 1991, and everybody everywhere wanted it in their arcades. I'm not sure why I didn't see it so much, but I do know that when I saw it, there was always a line standing by it, and you could never ever really get a chance to play a Spider-Man, because someone was always in that category, but when you finally did get the chance to play a Spider-Man, it was like striking gold. You just couldn't get enough of it if you were a Spider-Man fan, because again, this was Marvel's most popular IP, and the fact that Venom was the most popular villain at the time, and was smart fully put into the game as such, it was just something else. Sega really went above and beyond for this game and made sure that the IP was treated with absolute and total respect and at any time I see this I had to play it and now that I have my own arcade cabinet I play it all the time and probably can rush through it in under a half hour or less. Definitely one I always recommend to people if they've never tried it and I'll definitely recommend it to you if you've never played it before. And there you have it folks, Ilsung 4K's Top 5 Arcade Beat-Em-Ups. Now, note the word arcade in this because I probably will be doing a console version of this, and to help me out with that, I sure would like for you guys to leave your Top 5 Beat-Em-Ups down below, be them arcade-based or console-based, so that way maybe I could curate a list for that. And speaking of Top 5s, make sure you realize this is far from the last time I'm ever going to do this on the IlTV channel. We're going to cover Top 5 everythings. Top 5 Beavis and Butthead episodes, Top 5 Godzilla movies, Top 5 horror movies, Top 5 horror movie kills, Top 5 mom's homemade recipes. If you got some, leave them in the comments below, I'll make sure to review them. Seriously, we're going to cover a lot on this channel, and I'm very excited, so make sure you like and subscribe to the brand new IlTV channel right here. Also, make sure you catch me at 9pm on twitch.tv backslash illsun4k every Thursday night for the Total Terrorathon Thursday, as well as catching me as 10.30pm Saturday nights on twitch.tv backslash illsun4k. And if things start popping off enough on this channel, I might just start streaming on YouTube instead. And don't forget, folks, there's a light that never goes out, it only goes away, and it comes back the next day. And that light is the sun. So thank you for watching Ill TV, where if it's pop culture, it pops up here. It's Ill Sun 4K.